and welcome to tomorrow. If you're joining us live, this is going to be a fun participatory show. And if you're watching on demand, make sure to leave your comments. We do read every single one of those and we'll bring them back into the show because we love it when everyone here participates. This week's show is going to be epic because we're going to be go doing like the first four minute launch minute. Uh, someone in the chat room said we should do 15 seconds per launch. You can do that in 15 seconds, right, Mike? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you everything about it. <laughs> if you thought your 4K TV had a lot of resolu resolution, just wait till you see what we're downlinking from space. And we've also got black holes swallowing things up whole, I assume. Mm. It's going to be mm -hmm. nom nom. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an epically <laughs> awesome show. Stay tuned. Tomorrow, Orbit 11.43 begins right now. Good morning. Now. Too late! Too late! Too late! <laughs> the mic's automatically mute, and I obviously missed my cue, and so then I, like, the open rolled, and I started screaming to the control room, did I get it? Did I get it? And he's like, no, you missed now! And, they're, and like, Lisa turned to me and said, I know what you're going to do. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, let's get started, Mike. Uh, we talked about how there are four launches this week. Uh, holy mm -hmm. cats, I think we should get straight into it, so take it away. Let's do it. First off, we have to talk about a launch that actually occurred last Saturday. This was the uh, maiden launch of the ZhuQ rocket. And uh, unfortunately, uh, well, first off, uh, this particular launch occurred at 1800 Coordinated Universal Time, as I said, last Saturday, October 27th. It launched from the Jiquan Space Center in the Gobi Desert in Inner Mongolia. And its payload, not much is known about it. It's called the Weilai-1, or Future One Satellite, and it's operated by the Chinese Central Television, or CCTV. And it was intended to carry out uh, scientific experiments and perform Earth observation, and it was expected to launch in, uh, for, and, and be operated for about two years. But the rocket did not succeed because of a problem with the third stage of the solid rocket booster. All three stages are solid rocket fueled, and apparently there was a problem due to uh, attitude control, and so the third stage was not able to place the payload into orbit. But the private company Landspace is hopefully able to collect a lot of data and try again next time whenever they're ready. But yeah, let's move right along. Uh, the government of China didn't waste any time with an official launch, and they launched the Long March 2C rocket from Space Launch Site Number 2, also at the Jiquan Space Center in the Gobi Desert. And this one launched at, excuse me, uh, 43 minutes after midnight on Monday, October 29th, Coordinated Universal Time. And its payload was the CFO Sat, the Chinese French Oceanography Satellite, which is going to monitor the ocean's surface winds and waves and provide information on related ocean and atmospheric science and applications. The data from CFO Sat is going to allow scientists to achieve more accurate ocean forecasts and give earlier warning for severe events like tsunamis and cyclones. The data is going to be downlinked to both French and Chinese receiving stations, and CFO stat is expected to operate in a sun synchronous orbit for about three years. So, uh, congratulations to uh, China for having a successful launch uh, from this one. But uh, there was been quite a few other launches this week, and I'm, I'm really happy to see this type of data from the CFO stat. But I'm very excited to see an H-2A rocket, one of Jap uh, Jap Japan's rocket made by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. And this launched from the Tanigashima Space Center in southern Japan at 4.08 Coordinated Universal Time on Monday, October 29th. Its payloads actually had quite a few. Uh, the two primary payloads were Khalifasat and GoSat number two. Khalifasat is a remote sensing Earth observation satellite that was manufactured in the United Arab Emirates. It's also the first satellite to be built and developed entirely by a team of Emirati engineers without any outside help. So that's really awesome that they've gotten to that point. GOSAT-2 is a greenhouse gas observation satellite, also known as Ibuki for the Japanese government, and it's the first Earth observation satellite dedicated entirely to greenhouse gas monitoring. So this is really cool. And for those of you that don't know, the H-2A rocket is four meters in diameter as opposed to five meters in diameter like their H-2B rocket. So very happy to see a successful launch from Japan as well. Oh, man. 
And then uh, we also, I believe there was one more rocket that we had. This is one more launch of the Long March 3B launching a Beto 3 navigation satellite. This one was designated G1Q and it's the first, of, excuse me, Beto 3 satellite that is going into a equatorial geostationary orbit. All of the other geostationary Beto 3 satellites that they've launched have been tilted to the equator 55 degrees. This is of course in an effort to have global coverage for the Chinese government. Uh, this one launched on, at, on uh, November 1st at 800 Coordinated Universal Time and uh, they were able to successfully have this mission, which I am I'm very excited about. This was on Thursday. And uh, out of this, I believe that this makes 35 of the Beto 3 satellites, 42 that they've launched in total. And uh, they're hopefully gonna have global coverage very soon, especially in China, where uh, service was weakest with the, in terms of GPS satellites. So very cool to see this launch from China. Three launches from China this week and one from Japan. So that's really awesome. All right. Woo. Four minutes. Yay! Yeah, the, four, four minutes of our launch, our launch minute. What was, uh, what was your, your favorite launch this week, Mike? To be honest, um, I think my favorite was probably the H-2A rocket, although I really liked the, uh, the Long March 2C with the CFO sat, because since that was a French mission, we were able to get you know, high-definition uh, footage of the launch instead mm. of just the usual 30 seconds of standard definition that China likes to put out. So it was nice to see uh, some of those different views and, and uh, seeing the satellite, uh, or rather the rocket, uh, being tracked uh, during its flight. So that was really Is cool, just from a, a footage standpoint. That, like, but, um, uh, someone that's like not from China has flown on a Chinese rocket, like for a government agency, because like that mm -hmm. was from Kines, oh. right? That flew on that. Right. That yeah. From yeah. From CNES. Is that and the first you time? You guys might remember. You guys might remember earlier this year there was a Chinese launch for uh, that was launching an Argentinian satellite, and since that was for the government of Argentina, they also had. I think they actually had a live broadcast for that. The uh, the Argentinian space agency did a live broadcast of that. So. That was the first time I've ever seen a live launch uh, um, from China, so. Wow. Space Vogel's saying that that was not the first time, uh, but doesn't back it up with what the first time actually was, right? So you're saying the first time first another, an, an, first time another government, foreign government, a yeah. foreign government flew with China. on China. Not the first time that China flew a payload from someone else, because that's a different thing, Oh yeah, because right? that's, like yeah, that, that's a totally different yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, the CFO says the first one that's like a joint uh, collaboration satellite uh, to give data to both uh, the French Space Agency and the, the Chinese Space Agency. So we also have our, uh, the, the launch schedule, the, what am I trying to say, the, the marker for each launch for yeah. the, the countdown. We have our, our launch uh, rundown that we have, the, uh, the orbital statistics for the years. Uh, China has had 32 launch attempts this year, but uh, after uh, the ZHU-Q1 failed, they only had 31 that successfully made it to orbit. United States has 27 uh, successful launches. Russia has 12 launch attempts, but only 11 uh, made it all the way to orbit. And then the European Union has six. Japan now has six and India is still at four. So, whew, things are getting uh, pretty crazy. We're, I think we're just one launch away from uh, matching the record that was set last year. Um, not the record, but the amount of launches that we had last year total worldwide in mm. 2017. And hopefully there'll be a, a surprise uh, Soyuz launch here in a little bit, launching the GLONASS-M satellite, which is the Russian uh, type of navigation satellites. And uh, that'll get hopefully a lot more data for the uh, the Soyuz rocket. Yeah, I think that's well. due to launch in 45 minutes from right now. If you're watching live, um, you know, a actually one mention Prismara said uh, a lot of asterisks going on now, uh, and that's in the uh, that's because they're new. We didn't have them before. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the worldwide <laughs> graphic, you saw that uh, we're putting asterisks next to next to items that didn't necessarily uh, wouldn't be considered launch successes. But then it gets a little bit. It gets fuzzy as to like how we should do that because uh, you know there's an asterisk. If you look at the graphic, there was an asterisk next to the U.S. because Zuma launched January of this year, and mm -hmm. Zuma, I believe, technically, I guess it wouldn't have made orbit because it never made it around the Earth once, right? So, I mean, obviously, it was a, it, it 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 came back. So, do you count that as a mission? Like, do you count that as a failure? I guess if you go with the customer for that mission, you know, the customer didn't get the service that they, you know, paid for, or I'm assuming that they paid for. Yeah, but um, that wasn't a failure of the launcher, so... But it was a mission failure. It was a mission failure, yeah, but not, uh, like... Wait, 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 so is this a launch count or is this a mission count? 
Right, so point. it does say, it does say orbital count. launches. This is a launch count. I'm counting it as, as a success or at least a partial success for the United States, that Zuma launch, because the rocket was able to successfully fly. Yeah, the payload didn't, didn't uh, uh, work, but that wasn't the fault of SpaceX. I mean, even after the investigation, that was determined by everyone that SpaceX was not at fault for Zuma not working. Mm -hmm. but, okay, and you're saying right. only orbital launches. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that any Blue Origin launches that do not reach orbit, that also, those are not counted, correct? I don't, but yeah, I don't believe the the Blue Origin launches are considered in this. Uh, okay. In yeah, this we we yeah. don't count those in the uh, in this launch uh, count because those are just suborbital launches. Although we've talked about those test flights on the show because right. I think that they're really cool because it's no, no, involved no. with human space. Oh yeah, no, yeah. we yeah. agree. You're right. Yeah, Blue no. Origin. Virgin Galactic starts starts flying regular flights. I don't think we'll probably talk about each one, but definitely the first one with people on board is going to be a big deal. Yeah. I think the first handful, right? right? Because mm -hmm. as they ramp up service, it's going to be it's going to be a bigger deal. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and I know this isn't in our notes anywhere, but I saw on some website that uh, flights from Virgin Galactic uh, to space test flights are imminent. Wow. Uh, has anyone else heard that at all, or am I the only one that saw that? I mean, last I heard, there was six yeah. months out, so... <laughs> well, Mike, what did you hear? Yeah, and, and, and we, I even talked about that a little bit um, um, last week, about how they... Oh, well, actually, no, I was talking more about the Launcher 1 stuff, and we didn't... And, no, this is Galactic, Galactic specifically. Yeah, this is they, test... they, Virgin Galactic, with their Spaceship 2 vehicle, has said that they are going to be doing long-duration test flights, of, of full-duration test flights of the engine, and actually getting up to the uh, the type of altitude that they that they want to reach at least at, at first initially and i'm um, hearing weeks so. not months like they are weeks right. away from being able to do mm -hmm. test flights understand this is all rumor and hearsay so yeah. don't take this as well, fact but i i read that of, and i was like that's interesting well i saw this week some of their pilots were jumping into uh, white knight 2 and doing some flights in it cool. um, yeah. so that might be in preparation for what they're preparing to do so one, one other thing that I can say is I'm actually here at the National Space Society uh, Space Settlement Summit uh, that's here in L.A. And last night, George Whitesides gave a speech and, and confirmed the same thing, that, test, that these long-duration test flights of the Spaceship 2 are going to be imminent. He didn't say when, but uh, he said that it was going to be very soon. Imminent means a lot of things. Could you get, did you get an impression of, like, did they mean weeks? Or, like, imminent in space can mean... Six months, you know. I mean, space timelines are just different than the normal human yeah. timeline. I mean, Falcon Heavy was imminent for six years, right? <laughs> yeah. so. Exactly. Space exactly. launch system has been imminent for a whole decade. Right. So, did, so. You, yeah. did you get a, a sense of what that actually meant? Yeah, he talked quite a bit about like um, uh, doing a lot of installation on the inside. Uh, getting the interior to, to the level that they want it to be at, installing the, the passenger seats, and having kind of dummy weights in there so that the weight of the vehicle will actually be what an operational flight would be. I'll be a dummy then, weight. Uh, talking about how they've had a lot of success recently with uh, the rocket motors and that they're confident that they'll be able to pull off a uh, full duration test firing of it and not necessarily have uh, some of the problems that they had on the last test flight where uh, the, rock, the, the, the spaceship was, was pretty shaky and, and apparently it was pretty hard on the pilots to uh, not keep control. They were able to keep control, but it was a little bit more difficult than they anticipated. And that was because they got 7% more thrust than they anticipated on that flight, according to George Whiteside. So they're kind of taking advantage of that and figuring out the fuel ratios that they mm. need to pull off a full duration test firing without necessarily the same amount of fuel that they originally anticipated. So mm. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but that was, that was the impression that I got from his speech just last night. Oh, that's awesome. Cool. That's awesome. And you know what? Before we get into the regular news, anything else awesome from the conference that we should know about thus far? Oh, man. So far, well, uh, Relativity Space gave a really cool update who we had on, um, uh, what was that, like a month and a half ago or so? It was uh, like three talking months. about all the different um, upgrades and uh, progress that they've made at their, at their facility. And uh, they're going to be doing uh, uh, test firings soon trademark you know that could mean weeks or months of, of their engines and they are really happy with a lot of the progress that they've made and working on different materials and all that sort of thing so that's been a big highlight for me so far but um uh that was just the the, the first day and today i'm really looking forward to quite a few more speeches there's going to be uh, stuff going on about the moon village 
In fact, there's a Moon Village workshop being hosted here after, right after the, the, uh, the Space Settlement Summit that's being hosted by the European Space Agency. And John Warner, the director, is going to be here. And so there's a whole bunch of different uh, people showing up from China, uh, from Europe, from around the world to talk about collaborating on the Moon Village. So hopefully I'll, I'll get a chance to talk to as many of those people as possible. What, what's the Moon Bi Village, Space Mike? The Moon Village is the European Space Agency's uh, initiative that they announced to have a international collaboration to build a human-tended outpost on the surface of the moon. And uh, China uh, and Russia have both kind of come to it. Uh, come to them and said, hey, we're interested in collaborating on this in one way or another and bringing to the table different hardware and expertise that everyone might have to collaborate on that type of thing. Similar to uh, the, the whole Lunar Gateway thing that we've talked about, but as a surface space and not an orbiting space station. Awesome. Uh, well, we look forward to it. We uh, so it's funny because you're actually very near us right now. So your your signal's yeah. coming in super strong. Like Thirty feet away. <laughs> <I know. laughs> but at the conference, so um, uh, there to capture some footage for us. Um, there was a question from the chat room uh, from Lur asking, uh, "Are there any videos from the conference yet?" It's going to take a little bit of time to process that, though. I assume yes. Yeah, yeah, at least the interviews that, that we're collecting here. Um, if you want to see any of the speeches, the National Space Society is going to be posting all of the different uh, presentations. Um, some of them have said within a couple of days, and, and other members of the crew have said within a couple of weeks. So uh, just, just look out for the National Space Society on their, on their YouTube channel and on the different conference um, areas. Look up for Space, uh, space Settlement Summit. 2018 and within the coming weeks, and you should be able to at least see the presentations that they officially filmed there. I've been focusing more on, on just collecting interviews. Yeah, it seems like the chat room's really excited about uh, Moon Village. S. Joe Rover from to. YouTube says, uh, can't wait for Moon Village. Um, there were others in the uh, the, the chat. Um, Mike's yeah. shirt matches like the Moon Village theme. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dear Moon. The, yeah, uh, the, you guys the can BFR. see that, but uh, I got a Dear Moon shirt here. Here we go. <laughs> you're, you're breaking the illusion, Mike. <laughs> you're breaking the illusion. That's okay. You <laughs> kill the magic. <laughs> <laughs> they want to know where your legs are, too. <laughs> Where my legs are, yeah. they're, they're right here. Can't you see them? <laughs> I have two tiny little legs right there. Can't you see them? <laughs> All right, moving on. Oh, uh, man, what's happening? So when we get to the moon, Lisa, we want to have epic high-resolution footage. <laughs> we do, and to do yeah. that, we should probably test like some really high-quality cameras in space, right? Yeah. So you know they actually work? Well, guess what? We did! We tested an 8K camera on the International Space Station, and that makes me excited because cameras are cool. Carrie Ann has a question. Um, how the hell do I see it if I don't have an 8K <laughs> <know>. TV? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> you can't even see in a movie theater, it right? It must point. be amazing! <laughs> how do I know? No, you get four 4K TVs uh -huh. and put them together. <laughs> do, do you have, like, 3D glasses for that? Like, a 4K, 4K glass? Like, no, you need can you, glasses can you get, that. like, eight standard def definition TVs and put them together and make yes. a 4K, if, if 8K? You would need 16 standard definition That's TVs. That's expensive. <laughs> in order to get that. But 8K is oh, cheap. Yeah, okay, explain because one, this you, to it's me. It's four by four. It's funny that you mentioned, you know, being able to actually <laughs> okay. view it because um, I have, I, I clip, it, it's, you can see it on YouTube, you know, if you have the required screens with the high resolution. Um, <laughs> NASA's just put it on their YouTube channel um, and it's a three minute long video. I actually cut it down to about 45 seconds so we don't have to spend all day watching it. Um, and so we have it for you, except you're not going to be watching it in 8K because we can't even like play that from our systems. <laughs> wow, we're look at that. Okay. We're 4K at least. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that means she couldn't get the 4K original down. Wow. So, Thanks, Ben. Yeah, no, I'm going to give away all your secrets. <laughs> so th this, is the, this is the footage anyway, and I think it's really cool because if we want to get people excited about spaceflight, you know, we need to be showing them things that look beautiful because design is important in, and, and the quality of wow. imagery coming down from there is important. So I think by having this 8K camera, like, okay, maybe right now we can't, like, all at home, watch it on our giant, amazing, big screens. But like, by having this high quality footage, I guess people can use this for other projects, right? Like if someone is making like some cool like movie or documentary or whatever, or like, like one thing I was thinking of, you know how like you have those like 360 videos, but they always look really crappy because like, this yeah. is bad quality. Because you're zooming into it. Right, yeah. so if we have like high quality footage like this, is that gonna mean that we can do like VR and 360 stuff that doesn't look potato? Like, yeah, potentially. Yeah. This could allow you, this could be the beginning of what allows you to do VR 
from space, like from space station, but in a quality that, like you said, isn't potato. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it was also released yesterday, uh, Friday the 2nd of November, which was the 18th anniversary of having humans continuously occupying the ISS. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really cool way to celebrate that. Nice. That um, is a really cool way to celebrate that. Again, I just think it's funny of like, it, which is f also really funny because it does remind me a little bit of the same arguments that a lot of people had when Ben wanted to move to 4K initially for the show was that people were like, I can't even watch it in 4K, so why would you do that to me? And Ben was like, well, yeah, <laughs> but we're going there. And it, it just doesn't, if 8K just feels like so much further out to me. Throw it all away, we're 8K now, get rid of all the cameras. That's what I'm saying, so like, <laughs> I guess, I, I don't know, because normally we're not that far behind. I feel like my TV at home is a decent resolution. My computer is a really decent resolution. My phone is a really decent resolution. But it's sure as anything is not 8K. I think the cool thing is that by recording this stuff now in 8K, like when that becomes a standard in the future, because it probably will be, you know, we always just continually get better and it takes a while for regular everyday consumers at home to get that kind of standard, but they will get there eventually. And so now, We'll be able to see this footage from today, which maybe it's 10 years in the future when you can watch it at home, but you can mm -hmm. look back 10 years in high quality that matches what you'll have in, at home. You know, we can't go back today 10 years and look at something in 4K because no one was really recording that stuff for archival purposes. Right. So, mm -hmm. is it interesting enough to actually watch? It's, it's our a planet! It, it, it's that's not what I saw. Not in that footage. That was like the International Space Station, which I feel like I've it's, seen a million times it's, before. It's yeah, but they were the doing ISS. things. You don't usually see them doing things. Yeah, you see them very was, stoically in front of a camera. This was you cool. know, it playing felt, with toys and letting the microphone float so I can move around and play with the toys. It felt more toy. cinematic to yeah. me. Like they, it was just like it was real. It was in the moment. It was kind of cinematic. It was them just like just. A snapshot of their everyday life. You know, you had someone like pulling out the freezer and just like working on experiments. You had a, a Serena on on Chancellor. Um, she was like cutting some of the plants. Like it's just, it's yeah. footage. I don't think we've, Dude, we've they seen. Saw it. A I saw a blood draw from Alexander Gerst. I like, I didn't even know how to how you do a blood draw in I, microgravity. I that and you know, I that was pretty fat. wild. I was like, skip so. that part. Skip that part. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. And if you're wondering, it was a uh, Helium 8K camera by the company Red that uh, was delivered in April on CRS-14 mission. And it was a Space Act agreement that enabled this between NASA and, and the camera manufacturer. So we kind of like mundane things as, as camera manufacturers working with NASA to send things in space. Like that kind of opens up. Well, that brings like up a good point. This is a red camera. Red are normally red cameras are normally red from the manufacturer. Red they're normally <laughs> used in uh, cinema, right? So when you're watching mm -hmm. a movie, there's a there are two main camera manufacturers that you're generally going to see. I'm pr painting some broad, pretty broad strokes, and red is one of them. And a lot of them will shoot 8K, not so that they can deliver 8K, because they won't. They're going to deliver 4K. I mean, yeah, I guess that's the question. But what it does is it gives you something called crop factor. So mm -hmm. you can shoot an 8K and then you can go, oh, well, we got a little bit of garbage over here. We want to kind of reframe or we want to do a little bit of a movement in post-production. And when you have all that extra resolution, it opens up options for being able to do some of those things. And so to your point of making the International Space Station stuff a little more cinematic, it gives the documentary documentarians, uh, it gives this the people working in cinema, the editors, the ability to be a little bit more creative with the footage because they have more pixels to work with, assuming they're also shooting like raw and all of the other things so they can fully color correct and they have all of the things available to them. So like the exact opposite of what James Cameron did for the movie Avatar. <laughs> Kinda, yeah. Okay, just double checking. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> just want to uh, make sure I understand correctly. Uh, Johnny Spacer says, "Isn't 4K beyond uh, humans' visual acuity?" Um, no, actually, that is not correct. Uh, it depends on the size of the screen and to, in the size in which you are blowing it up and the distance in which you are from the screen. The closer you're going to get to an object and the larger that object, um, that, that resolution is going to get larger or smaller. So if you're looking at something like a giant 40-foot wall for, say, a mission control room, you know, you're know you going to be able to see those <laughs> pixels uh, for 4K. Yeah, is, that, is that what you're doing? Wow. 
Wait, like what? Whoa, eight K is amazing. How many Ks does like the human eye naturally like have? Uh, so that's tricky because the human eye doesn't quite work that way. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's not yeah. how we perceive vision. So that there isn't an easy correlation between <clears throat> how the human eye is processing an image. Like when you look at what the human eye is doing to get this image, it's like upside down and blurry and like some with color, some without color. Then your brain's <laughs> like, let's fix that, and then your brain does a lot of awesome things to your vision. Wow. Uh, it's it's pretty incredible. But like all of the stuff over here in your vision isn't really a thing. I mean, it's kind of a thing. Like, it, yeah, it's there when you need it to be, but you mentally block it out, even though you can actually. Oh, like see how you it. block out seeing your nose. Precisely, you do yeah. technically see your nose all the time, but you're not aware of it because it's not relevant to what you're looking at. Yeah. yeah. So anyhow, well, I found some cool stuff. Like, uh, the, uh, if you basically take the eye and you uh, turn it into essentially what a camera would be, it'd be a 43 millimeter lens. Uh, running at f one, f two point one. That's pretty horrible, uh, actually. So yeah, that's, that's not all that that's great. Not, it's not good. So, it's not good. So zero no. Ks? Is that what we're saying? Yeah, we have no Ks. <laughs> Our eyes are no Ks. Our eyes are zero Ks. Uh, well, uh, compared to a camera, the human eye, if you count all the rods and cones and everything in it, um, you have hundred and thirty million pixels. Uh, total. So only mm. 6 million of the eye's pixels are cones. The other 124 are rods so they just see in black and white. So. Huh. Wow. <laughs> Stephen Fiddler on YouTube, thanks. Now I'm aware of my nose as I watch the show. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> That's why we're here. Yeah, man. <laughs> Better yours than mine, man, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm excited for it because, uh, you know, resolution and dynamic range and all of these things improve over time. And then uh, the, we always have the exact same argument every single time. Why do I need high definition? My current TV is just fine. And then, like, we move to high definition, and then you try going back, and you're like, that looks like garbage and so then everyone wants high def why do you need yep. 4k my current tv looks just fine and then everyone tries to go that everyone gets 4k tvs they look back at hd and it looks like garbage and now we're hearing the exact same thing again why do i need 8k my current 4k tv looks just fine it's like what did you not learn from the last two times to be fair if an 8k tv existed and i could <laughs> afford it i right. probably would have one, one of those two things it's is just, true that's okay. what i'm saying okay like, well it's... i'm gonna go get a 32k tv and be a couple generations ahead of you, you all. You might as well. <laughs> so. Might as well. So. Man. Actually, I'd love to get like an AK TV for behind the scenes. Uh, I diverge. It wow. wouldn't it be cool to get like, anyhow. I yeah, do have to wait. say uh, that this... this for Space Mike? Wait, okay. does Mike, Mike have a question Mike? or does he want a thing? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. No, can we talk about something else? <laughs> <laughs> well, hang on, let's, let's, let's I was going to say, uh, I was actually, you know, up late last night working on stuff uh, for the show, and I saw a friend of mine who really doesn't care about space flight share the 8K footage on their Facebook page. See, there you go. And it's they were just like, this is unbelievable. Like, mm -hmm. I can't believe how cool everything looks up there. And I was just like, yeah, like, you know, you could have asked me. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, you know, it, matters, it was really man. cool to see that, you it's know. Good it's good that you answer because I would have been like, yeah, it's the same as in 4K, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> Doesn't that AK footage look great on your little iPhone? Whatever. <laughs> right. Debbie Downer, don't mind me. All right, Jared. Uh, oh, man. We, we've Speaking got more of Debbie Downer. Yeah, no I was kidding. About to say. Like, and, and I've got you right before our break, so yeah. I feel like I should have I should have baked you yeah, in we before this. Yeah, yeah, well, at you. least at least what we know is that it will be all uphill after yeah. this story. Is that here. a true statement? Sure. Um, That's not a true statement. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get there. Um, so, Together. Um, you know, we lost two spacecraft this week. So We lo We can't find them anymore? <laughs> no, they're dead. So oh. <laughs> They've died. Wow, that's dark. So, um, <laughs> dude, there's no other way to put place, it. Jared. There's no other way to put it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it here, but yeah, we lost two spacecraft this week. Kepler, um, the Kepler Space Telescope, which launched in 2009, it was retired on October 30th. And then Dawn, which launched in 2007, it didn't respond to a deep space network check-in um, on October 31st. Both of these spacecraft, they, they vastly outlasted their original design lifespans, and it actually wasn't like anything technical that caused them to die. Uh, well, I guess it was sort of in a sense. Their reaction wheels stopped working, and they had to use the hydrazine fuel on board in order mm. to maintain attitude control. Um, so they actually ended up dying because they ran out of fuel. So they're not really to... dead, they just can't point. Yeah, yeah they can't point. So it, it wasn't a fault of the engineering or the technology on board, it was a fault of the fuel. Um, they just didn't have enough fuel um, on board. And uh, you know, the Dawn mission was amazing. It used 
Ion engines, electric propulsion, it was the first spacecraft to orbit two bodies, and that's what the ion propulsion um, enabled it to do. Um, it went to Vesta, which is the largest asteroid in the solar system. It's about 575 kilometers across. And before we went to Vesta, um, this is what it looked like from Hubble. You know, we didn't really have a great idea of what it looked like. Like, obviously, we knew it was like lumpy, but we didn't know that it was going to be. Yeah, we didn't know oh. it was going to be this incredible place that Dawn ended up giving us the high resolution imagery of, where we can actually look at it. We can see that there's striations. There's what we call differentiation in it, which means that this wasn't like. You know, this is like maybe half of Vesta. So something in the past hit it and blew off a huge amount of material, which mm. very interestingly, Dawn actually confirmed that an entire class of meteorites that we have here on Earth came from Vesta. So there was there was sort of wow. speculation that this that these Vestoids uh, came from Vesta uh, because we could see it through some of Hubble's instruments that it was similar in composition. But Dawn, it's basically like check mark. Yep. These are these are all from Vesta, and it's a very large population of meteorites too, which is uh, super exciting that we were able to study it both in situ and here on the Earth. Um, so some really cool stuff. And then there which, was. Uh, do, you, do you know which meteor population it is? Is it like the Leonids, the Persids, something like that? Um, so it's not associated with a meteor shower. It's just associated with a oh, specific oh, oh. type uh, of meteorite. They're usually uh, very rich in olivine um, because these meteors were blasted out of them, essentially blasted out of the mantle of whatever Vesta was before. Um, so in, in the mantle, you get a lot of uh, things like olivine, and uh, that's how we're able to tell that uh, Vesta was actually differentiated. So it had layers in its interior like the Earth does. Um, but not now. You know, it's really itty-bitty. It, all the heat went away from it. So yes, carry on. Olivine, a rock-forming mineral used as the gemstone <laughs> peridot. <laughs> For those of you who did not know, because I was like, you said a word I did not understand. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Google. So, we should have like an Alexa in the yeah. middle. Yeah, we that should put, be amazing. Uh, I was about to say, olivine um, is actually the fart rock that we talked about earlier this year on Mars that uh, might be yeah. pumping out methane. If you dump water on it, it has methane come out of it. It's it looks so the fart rock. The fart, well, that's what the chat room called it. I'm just <laughs> rolling with what the I chat mean, room called it. So. We can use it for jewelry. It's pretty. Yeah. Well, Peridot. Oh, yeah. Paradise. And that's a cartoon that's thing, right? Pretty. Steven Universe or something? Yeah. Sure. Anyways, um, there was also Ceres that Dawn went to, uh, which is a dynamic world. Um, you know, uh, this is what it looked like with Hubble, um, because Hubble was basically the best we had before Dawn. And then you could see... Hubble needed contacts. You, Everybody knows it. You could see there's that really bright <laughs> white spot on Ceres, and we couldn't figure out what that actually is it a heart? was. Is it a heart? Oh, is it a heart? Is it a heart? No. No, it's not. It's just um, a white spot. It's a bunch of salt. <laughs> oh, so, oh, wow, um, that. So, yeah. So, uh, it's a bunch of salt that's actually uh, sort of uh, sublimed at the surface. Um, so, that means that Ceres was a dynamic world. It, it has recent cryovolcanism, um, you know, cold volcanoes, like, like, uh, like basically mud volcanoes, I guess hmm. is the best way to describe it. Um, and it shows that there's a potential ocean beneath its surface as well. Um, so, Dawn was put into an orbit that would allow certain planetary protection standards to occur. Um, essentially, Dawn's orbit right now says that there's a 99% probability that it will not impact in the series over the next 50 years. Because we don't want to accidentally contaminate series with, uh, with what we have, wh what was brought along on Dawn. So... Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, we lost Kepler, which is one of my favorite missions, um, which was hunting for something that was unknown really at the time, back when it was launched in 2009, which was exoplanets. These planets that go around other stars, we knew that there were some, but we didn't know how many there were out there. Were now they they're super known. Yeah, we didn't know. You know, back in, I remember it being in astronomy class in 2009, and my professor was like, we don't know, man, like, could be all over the place. They could be incredibly rare. Um, so, you know, Kepler was launched in order to get that data. And when you actually look at the data, the chart that shows you how many exoplanets we've known, you'll notice that in 2009, when Kepler's launched, whoosh, it goes up. Because it turns out, Kepler proved that exoplanets, they're not just, you know, these real things that we can pick up in signals. They're basically everywhere. A star, a star at some point in its life has a planet going around it. Um, planets outnumber stars in our galaxy. And if you think about it, the Milky Way, has 400 billion stars in it. 
And that's a lot of potential planets. And then using Kepler, we're able to extrapolate that basically anywhere from 10 to 35% of the stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, likely have a rocky planet the size of the Earth in its habitable zone. So Kepler basically revolutionized how we look at our place in the universe just by looking at a small patch in our own galaxy. It has completely changed the game in the hunt for life, the hunt for exoplanets. Um, they're even using Kepler in order to look for supernovae and see supernovae at the very second that they started. Uh, it was over 50 supernovae that it was able to capture right as the supernovae started and were able to get that data and look at it and interpret it. I mean, just there was such a wealth of information that came from Kepler that we are literally going to be pouring through that for the next decade or so. Um, so it, it just, Kepler changed everything. Everything in what we understood in our, our place in the universe. The thing to me the craziest thing to me about Kepler is that it was only looking at one point in the sky, only one constellation. It mm -hmm. wasn't doing the whole 360 degree view of the sky. It was just looking at one constellation of sickness mm -hmm. and found all those planets and all those supernovae. That's just amazing to me. We were only looking at one section of the sky yeah. and found all of that. Yeah, and then during, then during the huh. K2 mission, they let it drift because they, you know, the reaction wheels stopped working. Um, and then they actually used the technique to balance it with the, with the uh, photon pressure coming from the light of the sun um, with the remaining reaction wheels and kind of let it drift um, and look around. But it basically uh, proved that, yes, uh, you can detect exoplanets this way and was basically the forerunner to test the Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite um, that's up there now and is basically doing an all-sky survey, not as far out as Kepler, but still, you know, they're expecting tests to get 20,000 planets, which would be an order of magnitude more than the exoplanets that Kepler discovered. And those planets planets will be closer, so then you've got a good data set for things like the James Webb Space Telescope to look at, um, and also future telescopes as well, like European Space Agency's Plato Telescope that they're developing right now. Um, just, I mean, like, planning for, proving something, changing our role, and developing the data for the future to push that even further. Like, holy moly, like, they're, they're very rarely does a mission, does a, space, a single spacecraft do something as profound as Kepler did to our understanding of a specific type of science. From so. the chat room, Beth mm -hmm. says, is it just me or have a lot of reaction wheel failures come up lately? Um, yeah, it turns out uh, the reaction wheels uh, tend to fail quite a lot. You know, they are uh, a very fast rotating system. And also uh, we've kind of figured out that solar radiation has a lot to do with the failure of reaction mm -hmm. wheels as well. Um, so uh, maybe we should get uh, Vax uh, to get his reaction uh, sphere yep. um, up on the spacecraft because that would work uh, significantly better than reaction wheels. Come on, Vax, so. we're all counting on yeah, you. Yeah, Vax, <laughs> let's make it happen. We'll make it happen. Vax. So. Actually, Vax, Vax did comment. He actually said, because uh, we were talking about, um, so it just can't point, and he said, no, Don is, in fact, dead. Yes. Uh, and then Zaphan if you Basically, if you can't orient the spacecraft, you can't keep the solar panels aimed at the, at uh, the sun. That'll, so. Yeah, that'll be, that's yeah. bad. And then yeah. it's dead. I was yeah. like, can't we just refuel it? And mm. then, but then actually, I wish. Kitty asked that very question. Can they go and refuel them? Um, actually, I was going to say, um, you know, Ceres, because we don't want Dawn to hit it, um, there's actually been some talk in the past couple of days about flying another mission to Ceres, both to study it and also to basically grab Dawn and boost it. <laughs> so that way it doesn't actually end up hitting <laughs> Ceres. So, so that would be really difficult, though, that's because cool, though. We should do that. you've got to find a spacecraft that's in orbit around Ceres, and you basically have like a last known position and then it's like anybody's guess what happens after that because you have to deal with like oh, yeah. the gravity of Jupiter pulling on the spacecraft and other things like that so um, that would be a heck of a mission to pull off though if they can make it happen so you just send a BFR yeah, yeah be obviously obviously so yeah yeah the one with the big nose cone that'll just go and grab it <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> you'll get that James Bond movie <laughs> <laughs> if you do do something like that though like just because you don't want it to hit Ceres, right? Yes. So space is big, but it's not that big. If you put it, you'd have to like also then make sure that it gets put on the same, on a trajectory that would also then not impact something else, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and you know, if we put it at a stable orbit, you know, like a couple thousand miles away from Ceres, 
you know, that can end up yielding you tens of thousands, so maybe hundreds it, of thousands. But like of actually, years. like bringing it to a different stable orbit. Yeah, we've got a. We would have to bring it out of its current orbit. Its current orbit uh, is somewhere on the order of like four thousand kilometers at apogee, and um, it comes down really close, like forty kilometers at perigee. Oh yeah. So that's why we really like want to grab it and get it out of the way because that it's very close, um, but that gives you a little bit of time in order to actually go out and, and maybe move it out of the way. I just okay. can't if picture how that, that mission would work. That would be insanely complicated. Yes, it would, and that's why it sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so You'd have to go with another ion engine or something like that. Otherwise, just getting there and then figuring out where the spacecraft is and all the maneuvers that you would need to do in order to rendezvous and, and capture the thing would be insane if you are using traditional rockets. Yeah. Like I, mm -hmm. just, yeah. Ion engine, plus we have something else crazy that comes out in the next couple of years. It's the only way that I could see that that would be. Someone should model this in Kerbal Space Program. Oh, Obviously. yeah, someone model this for us. We'd love to see that. Mm -hmm. That would be great. <laughs> post it Post it somewhere, like, in, post it in community. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Use it as mission builder, and then we can try to do it ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, right? Zapfan, Zapfan from YouTube said, Zapfan, Zapfan. Rip, rest, rest in peace, Don and Kepler, Zapfan, Zapfan. Oppie call home. Yes. Oh, yeah, we're waiting yeah. on op opportunity as well. And luckily, they just announced that they're done with the 45-day campaign shenanigans, and they're going to continue to do uh, checking in with Oppie for a extended period of time. Nice. Uh, no mention of when that cutoff will be, uh, but, uh, you know, for Spirit, they at least tried for, for 14 months. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. Um, but luckily that extension will go into the time when you can actually get the cleaning events on the solar panels So uh, maybe Oppie will be warm enough to survive that so that leads oh. into the next comment from the chat room Which is from Jfro asked does recent loss of all these spacecraft free up research time or is it all onions? I've never um, heard that phrase before but so uh, yeah, that's a pretty good one. I guess onions and crying uh, um, yeah. Maybe yeah, that's yeah. my best uh, guess yeah. Jfro. Um, basically what it ends up doing it does end up freeing up deep space network time um, Which does cost you from mm -hmm. an op operational standpoint, um, but also when you've got uh, like a mission like Kepler, which just generated a tremendous amount of data, uh, people are going to people are going to be working with that data for another 10 years at least. So um, so that kind of stuff, you know, um, that's still going to cost. But obviously a certain amount of money is now being freed up uh, that could go elsewhere or certain scientists that are working on the mission can now go elsewhere as well to maybe go support another mission. It's not uncommon for scientists, especially on NASA missions, once the mission's done, they go to a similar mission, help them out, and kind of keep going with that. So, uh, And the final comment from uh, Vax uh, talking about uh, reaction spheres and him helping out, doing my best! <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, for, yeah, for those who don't yeah. know, uh, Vax has been on the show many times. He's working on something called a reaction sphere. Uh, we actually have a show, I think, was it this year? I think it was this year, talking about the reaction spheres. This year, last year, Orbit 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, he's been on many, many times. One of the, m one of the most? He's up there. He's, uh, like, one of the top ones. He's one of the top ones, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, certainly go back in the archives and take a peek. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and go into a calendar break. But before we do, we wanted to thank people who helped make this show possible. These are our Escape Velocity patrons. These are people who contribute $10 or more to this episode. Uh, you know, in, in people like this, uh, they're, they're helping make the show go week after week. you got to keep the lights on. got to keep the station in orbit. Right, right. I keep filling it up with uh, our fuel so we can stay around uh, planet Calf behind us. That's very, very important. Uh, but really, we, we appreciate everyone uh, contributing to the show. And if you can't contribute financially, certainly consider contributing via um, just simply subscribing to the YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com slash TMRO, hit the subscribe and the bell icon. Um, you know, whatever you can do. Also, if, if that doesn't work for you, head on over to community.tmro.tv. Uh, and, you, you know, if you've got some sort of talent, maybe you're great at 3D animation, maybe you're great at uh, programming, maybe you're great at uh, cooking, it doesn't matter. There's something that you do that you're passionate about in addition to space. We would love to work with you and do cool things with that passion uh, because uh, we're a giant community of space nerds and we love doing this stuff together. Uh, and, uh, you know, we find fun, new, interesting things when we all collaborate on mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. And that's what all of that stuff is for. Right. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, more space news.
And we have acquisition of signal. Uh, <laughs> nerd! <laughs> That's what I mean, we're nerd. calling it now. Yeah, acquisition well, of signal. AOS. Well, AOS, well. right? Well, you don't want to say, you don't want to come back and be like, welcome back, because you didn't go anywhere. We went somewhere. Yeah. Right? So we can say, and we're back, but that's cheesy and lame. So I was trying to come up with something at the last minute. I'm like, AOS, right? Because that's what I do when I fly. I'm like, LOS, AOS. <laughs> so. I think we all do that. Oh, what? We what? what? We like. So, come on, come on. Awesome. Did you guys like it? That's AOS? awesome. I like it. I, just I like it. Thanks for like sticking it. with us or whatever. Or yeah, but uh, but we're around. we're space nerds, so AOS, right? All right. I'm not wrong, right? All right, whatever. Uh, no, I like it. <laughs> uh, you know, we just had a calendar break uh, talking about uh, launches and uh, kind of going back to launches. Michael, I'll head it back over to you. Uh, we had a uh, Russian failure not that long ago of one of their boosters. Everyone walked away, which I think is absolutely, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Hey, uh, any landing you walk away from is a good one. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. The reason why I wanted to talk about this again this week is because the uh, official investigation into the launch failure has wrapped up and they have published the, uh, the results of that. And uh, apparently it was all due to a sensor. Apparently there was a faulty sensor that was uh, installed on one of the boosters. In fact, we have a video of, uh, on, uh, of a camera that was on board the rocket during this launch. And uh, near the end of it, we get to see exactly what happened with this. Plus, it's also really beautiful footage to see. Uh, this is not real on. time. This is sped up. No, yeah, definitely. This is very, yeah, this is way sped up. And of course, this was the, the launch that occurred on October 11th, the Soyuz MS-10 spacecraft. And apparently, according to uh, uh, Oleg uh, Skorobakadov, he said that the sensor was damaged during the final assembly uh, at the Baikonur Cosmodome in, in Kazakhstan. He added that uh, they have concluded, it's been proven and confirmed, that that faulty sensor, which was off by like a couple of degrees, bent a couple of degrees, um, was what caused the, uh, the booster to, to fail. You'll see here in just a moment, one of the side boosters, as they separate, is going to not quite separate all the way and slam back into the rocket and uh, make the, the upper stage just go everywhere. And so they've looked at all the different rockets, uh, especially the Soyuz FG rocket, as well as, as all the other variants that are going to be flying soon, and confirmed uh, to, to make sure that it uh, uh, doesn't happen again on any other launches and that the, uh, the, the rockets that are in queue right now don't have that similar problem with any of the sensors on the boosters being bent so that it doesn't get the uh, um, accurate information it needs in order to do a proper separation. Here we go. Boom. Oh, my gosh. You can see how crazy that is that this, the side booster just slammed right back into that thing and then the rocket goes everywhere i mean we got to see earlier um uh when this happened the uh, the view from the inside the cabin and them being shook around a lot and we can see from that slow motion there just how much the upper stage was pushed all over the place that's insane Whew. but like uh, they cut some now of that that they've footage out through this investigation go ahead yeah what are you gonna say uh, it feels like they cut some of that footage out right it feels like the booster separates uh, unless the the reaction happened faster than the shutter on the camera, which, uh, depending upon the frame rates, probably anywhere between 16 and 30 milliseconds, um, it seems mm -hmm. like like you saw the booster kind of separate, and then it looked like it like it didn't quite separate right, and it looked like it kind of almost made a re-impact event, and then all of a sudden they cut to footage of the booster like spinning and spiraling. Uh, it feels like they they took something out there. Yeah, they they very may well have, but that might just be it, uh, the video being sped up and just missing the, those frames there. But you could be right. They might have edited something out of it. I'm just glad that they published that at all. Period. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, J, J. Michael uh, uh, on YouTube says, it was not actually a faulty sensor. It was a bent pin that didn't trip the sensor, technically speaking, I think. Okay. Wow. No, yeah, right, right. yeah, one way or another, yeah, still, it was still the, uh, the booster making <laughs> impact um, and creating a really bad day. Um, does this mean that now that we have root cause, uh, we've flown some Soyuzes since then? So you I? Mm -hmm. So what's pl Soyuz plural? Soyuzes? <laughs> I think it's uh, Soyuz. Uh, uh, well, Soyuz means union, so I think that's already plural. <laughs> wow. um, d does that mean that we're on track for being able to fly humans on Soyuz and, and like, we're not going to have to de- D orbit, not D orbit, but what, you know what I'm trying to say, abandoned station. Right, right, right. Um, what's going to happen is with the uh, the Soyuz 2 variants and the Soyuz uh, SPA variants, which fly out of Kuro Space Center in French Guiana, 
um, even though they're they're slightly different. I mean, the, the booster stage and the first and second stages of the rocket are exactly the same as the Soyuz FG variant that's used for the crewed launches. Before the next crewed launch, which is officially scheduled for December 3rd, whether or not that holds, the next launch of a Soyuz FG rocket is going to be later this month launching a Progress spacecraft, the cargo spacecraft uh, that brings up cargo to the International Space Station on the Soyuz FD. And uh, that's going to, to prove once and for all whether or not the, uh, the, the steps that they've taken, their, their action plan, um, is successful and whether they can proceed with the next crewed launch on December 3rd. So that's, that's the game plan right now. Chris Radcliffe b brings up a really good point in the chat room. Says, "Well, do we, uh, I said we have root cause? Um, <laughs> yes. Do we really have root cause? Why was the pin bent? How do we know the changes they're making will help with the next non-pin problem? And that—that's a fair. Uh, you know, I just kind of said root cause, and that's not a fair thing for me to say, because that's a very specific thing. Understanding root cause, you can't mm -hmm. just say I understand root cause and just kind of have a broad overview. You have to know precisely what it was." what caused it. Well, right, because saying like, oh, oh, well, it was just a pin, you guys, not a big deal. It's a totally different thing than saying, it was a pin, now we went back to all of those sensors and double checked all of those pins, mm -hmm. or we you know, we saw that they were all bent, and then we had to go back to the manufacturer and say, why did you bend our pins, or not? Or like, somebody yeah. stepped on that one, and instead of it going into the FOD bag, the uh, foreign object debris bag, it went into you know the bin of sensors with non-bent pin like there's a whole lot of that and that some of that comes down to uh quality assurance and you know all those sorts of things like i you know i obviously don't know what their program looks like but assuming you know if it was something like in my house uh <laughs> either that sensor normally should have gotten thrown out or i would yell at ben for putting it back into the drawer <laughs> with all the other sensors <laughs> with the non-bent pins like there were you know there would be some sort of uh conversation there or um and you're right Right, I mean, but you're right. <laughs> well, there's lots That's, of reasons a fire could start. Is it, yeah. They're saying that because I, mean, I almost uh, burned my house down this last For those of you we'll in Discord, talk, we'll talk about how I Look. legitimately almost burned my house down. Yeah. All I'm going to say as an engineering student is that if it's not on fire, it's a software problem. Right, pretty much. <laughs> so. so, I mean, yeah, it's it, it could be a quality control issue, as, some, as uh, Citizen one, or 51634 in the chat room saying. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things. So, like, if they narrowed it down to the one thing, that's fine. But you're right. The root cause is, are all of the sensor pins that way? Is that a manufacturer issue? Did somebody just step on one? What have you done to correct that so that moving forward you don't have more sensors with bent pins? They hit it with a drill. <laughs> or from, the way that I, from the way that I understood this, um, where it was built, uh, the rocket was built in, in the Samara factory, um, they do a very thorough inspection of, of everything before it's shipped off to the launch site. And then at the launch site is where they do a lot of the, like, the final integration, just like we do. Um, and uh, Everything was was on point where it needed to be when it left the factory. But they're saying that that what caused this this bend in the pin that was supposed to trip the sensor, so that the vent line at the top of, of the booster would actually uh, do the vent like it's supposed to to have that separate. Mm -hmm. You could see the other boosters separate like they were supposed to. It was right. just that one that didn't. And so this was from all all that assembly and at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. So that's where the quality assurance problem was because according to their, invest, you know, all the checks that they do before it's shipped off, everything was was where it was supposed to be. So. I mean, that could totally happen. You know, uh, I have been on vacations where I have literally made a list of all the things that I want to pack and Ben always thinks that I'm hilarious because I make a list of like three pairs of shorts and 14 t-shirts and 67 pairs of shoes. And he always thinks that I'm, I'm overdoing things. And that's probably no fine but i pack all of that stuff and i make sure that don't go to that camera i make sure that it's all there <laughs> and it's all packed and that's awesome and then i get there and i have no socks because i <laughs> quite literally didn't put it on the list and so i never pack them and so i don't have them and so there th that could be a situation where everything is totally fine like you were saying like i where everything gets assembled and then uh, maybe there was a check and then by the time you get the, the launch site yep exactly it's just simply not on the list to double check <laughs> i hope your eyes yeah. hurt for making He's that stupid that face camera. this entire time Dang it! <laughs> <laughs> I had a really good. I was staring right. It was amazing. Oh, uh, man. That's because he's actually packed without a list and have forgotten things. But we won't talk about that here right yeah. now. Well, <laughs> obviously, what we need to do, we need to make a step of. We need to make a, a procedural 
you know, manual right. in order for packing. Right. Like, like, okay, the shirts are in. Now we're going to move to. Uh, but they have now that, we're going right. to move to twelve dot one But Russia uh, has installing that. the socks. I do that. So we just need everyone to does that. Not so from Baikonur, and then it'll be fine. No, it seems it seems like they have like a, a running. It seems like they have a running QA problem. This is just my like. This is just me from the yeah. outside looking in. It seems like something has gone wrong with the quality assurance, and I don't under. It feels like it's kind of sudden. Actually, if you go to uh, community.tv mm. or tmr.tv, uh, community.tmro.tv, I can say things clearly. Uh, there is an entire thread talking about. Uh, so, like, is this the end of of Soyuz? Because it does feel like things have kind of come up. Recently, and one I mean, of the few years, right? And yeah, one of the going theories was that maybe some of the older engineers that took a lot of pride in their jobs, what, regardless of what area that they were working on, mm -hmm. maybe a lot of those people are retiring, and some of the newer people maybe not are caring as much, or mm -hmm. took some of those things for granted, or just simply aren't checking things. I mean, I don't. Again, I don't know. I obviously do yeah, not work there. Too. I've heard too that the pay over there is terrible and that they've had a really hard time bringing in new talent because they can have a better career somewhere else in Russia. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the yeah. people that are there are, are the reason that they're there is because they're passionate. And you know, we keep hearing about, you know, we will find those who are responsible and they will be punished for it. And we kind of never hear about them again. And this always kind of makes you nervous. Like, yeah. did they just punish the guy that's been there for 30 years and is the only one who knows how to install that properly? Like, I'm sure they have documentation so that anyone can do it. But I mean, the people that are working there are not being paid well. They're not being paid as well as American engineers. And they're there because of the passion, because they love what, what they're doing, or at least love, love the Russian space program. So... It makes me very nervous that there's not good uh, incentive to keep the quality and control up and to bring in new uh, talent and to have ingenuity. I would argue that if you're passionate, pay doesn't matter as much. Right. I mean, yeah, you can use that argument to go either way to say, like, either yeah. they're there because they want to be there and, you know, but they're not paid well. So therefore, they're not going to do a good job or they are there because they love it and they're going to do a good job regardless of, uh, I mean, obviously, within reason. Right, like you can't pay them nothing. That yeah, and sense. I I remember reading an article like five years ago about uh, you know a, a significant brain drain in in Russia's space industry because so many engineers were leaving because they weren't getting paid. They were leaving for the petroleum industry because that's just getting mm -hmm. money chucked at at every avenue mm -hmm. that it possibly can. Um, and and that's a serious problem, you know, if you're not paying your people well enough, people are going to go elsewhere wherever they get paid. I mean, passion is great in everything, right. um, but at the end of the day, money talks. And yeah, passion doesn't pay the bills, unfortunately. Yeah, it, passion, it just doesn't. So, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Remember, and if, as and if you don't pay your workers that are building new launch sites, they're going to go on strike, which has happened multiple times with the Vostochny Cosmodrome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. As Stormer in the chat room points out, remember that they still need to do a spacewalk to check out the whole on the Soyuz that is attached to the International Space right. Station, yeah. right? So it was like right. it was like one two punch That's on this one. Been, that officially has now been rescheduled for December 11th, as long as that December 3rd flight of the next Soyuz uh, takes off as as planned, and uh, they're going to try to rush and do that that spacewalk before uh, the um, the time for like the, the the expiration date for for how much time the Soyuz MS-09 can spend on orbit expires. So right. they need to, uh, to investigate that because the crew has to come home before that expiration date. Dang. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, here's hoping. I, I, I don't, I, I'm hoping that this is something that can be fixed. It seems like it's a multi-pronged issue. We'll see. Well, so, they've yeah. got to be under a lot of pressure right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, right? sure. Yeah. They're the only people who can bring people to and fro. Right now, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's just, that's got to be a massive amount of pressure, just an, an incredible amount of, of stress mm -hmm. being placed on them. And, and like, you got to remember, too, that that's a customer yeah. as well. That's money that's coming in. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, if that stops, you stop as well. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. That's something that's worried me quite a bit once commercial crew vehicles come online. Is the Russian space program going to suffer or cut back a lot of their operations because they don't have that NASA customer on, on Soyuz flights anymore? I mean, we're still going to have like one or two uh, every once in a while, but we're mostly going to be using the commercial crew vehicles once those come online. So it kind of makes me worried for uh, the Russian space program a little bit. What if we need a new 
Can't they just not... sell those NASA seats to like tourists instead? Yeah, anyone other than NASA. Yeah, now. but why would you, if, if you were a tourist, why would you pay, what is it, 70 million, 80 million? Well, uh, I feel like that was inflated pay... because it was NASA. Well, I okay. mean, Cut it in half, it's still more than... I mean, I think it was inflated because they're the o literally the only ride in town. Well, I mean, NASA astronauts are still going to be flying on Soyuz when commercial crew comes on online. And also, international astronauts are going to be flying on commercial mm -hmm. crew, even though Soy Soyuz is still going to be flying astronauts. So it's not like, it's not like there's going to be a hard cutoff. Um, but you know, there will be a cut, I would expect. At some point, but I don't think that's going to be happening anytime soon, at least. I mean, I don't. I personally don't know the contracts or anything like that. I don't I don't foresee it happening in the, like, the next three or four years. Like, maybe by 2028, right. sure, maybe things are wrapped up by then. But, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't feel that in the near term, things like that are, I don't think it's going to dry up, at least in the near term. But also, I don't know the contract stuff about that. So I'm probably wrong, and someone will correct me in the comments. So. <laughs> they always do. <laughs> well, no. That's why it's awesome. Yeah, that's why it's good. It's a group so, conversation. Exactly. Yeah, we, we get stuff wrong. Yeah. All right, let's move From on. understanding, they have to... They, okay, never mind. No, 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 go ahead. Finish your thought. <laughs> if you got Let, something. No, finish your thought. From my understanding, I mean, they have to order seats and, and flights on the Soyuz years in advance. And the cutoff to order uh, new flights, like like the, the flights that we're talking about, the intermittent flights that NASA astronauts are going to fly on Soyuz after commercial crew comes online, those have already been booked. Those are already in place. But if commercial crew doesn't come online by twenty by like the end of 2019, that is the end of the, the flights that we can book with Russia. They're like their cutoff date to have flights to have regular operations and and fully crewed at the International Space Station. Like we have to have commercial crew by the end of 2019 because we'd have to put in the order now and it would be two years before the rocket is even ready to fly on whatever missions that we order. So I feel like both yeah, Boeing and mission, SpaceX. If we need a mission for March 2020, we're we're a little bit too late to, to order that. No. Well, they, it's probably SpaceX, Boeing, and Blue Origin, and some other company we never even heard of before. We'll probably make that by then. Uh, and actually, I'm sorry. One final thought from Tewicked, who says, also quick reminder that U.S. cosmonauts also flew on Soyuz when shuttle was active, which also brings up an interesting point. If you're a U.S. NASA astronaut flying on a Soyuz, are you now a cosmonaut or are you an astronaut? We'll pin that for a later time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I just want to know, like, how do you, how does that, like, okay. Um, Lisa, is it, is we'll it hand it over to you. state? Anyway. Um, wow. Yes. Yeah, so uh, all this talk about the space station, right? But like, I was, I was wondering what experiments have been going on up there. Like, what's science happening up there? Why? What's we, the point? Why are we even sending people to the space station? What are they doing up Do there? Do they just take pictures of the Earth all day? Do they kind <laughs> of they they just tweet? EK, apparently. <laughs> yeah, that's all they yeah. do. It's all stage. It's all meant to be for a documentary. It's wow. not actually real science. There's no data. Oh my god. No, I'm kidding. Um, so I don't this, like this. That's a really expensive <laughs> set. <laughs> 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 Oh, it's all there to prove the Earth is round, right? I, I think my know. favorite part about this is your uh, misspelling here. Kale and Dragoon no, lettuce. No, I googled that. It's legit. It's dragon, but it's Dragoon? Yep. Okay, so uh -huh. you're yep. probably wondering why we're talking about lettuce. Uh, one of the major um, experiments that was worked on this Shut week was growing <laughs> plants in space. So uh, there's uh, something called the veggie experiment. You probably maybe heard that we've been um, trying to grow plants in space for a while on the space station. They're these little pillows that they have seeds inside and then... <laughs> All the astronauts have to do is put the pillows into the um, growth chamber, put some water in, and basically kind of just let it grow, which is pretty cool. Um, so they just started let this it week. Let it grow! Let it grow! Okay, there copyright, we go. Copyright! Copyright! <laughs> Man. Oh, the algorithm has hit us. Oh. So this week... NBC's claiming it. Basically, neither one of you can sing, so it's fine. They've go grown on. lettuce before, they've grown zinnia flowers before, but this time they grew, started to grow kale, and a mini romaine lettuce, which the um, variety is actually called dragoon lettuce. Nobody needs kale. Kale, no kale. No, there's no. gonna be kale in space. Nobody needs kale. And the thing is, Hard is pass. it's not edible. Hard these, pass. Hard these pass. These specific varieties only take 28 <laughs> days to grow. So in four weeks, we're gonna get like photos of the space station with the astronauts eating kale. Not and eating all, kale. All of the like, well, not gonna eat kale. There's, there's gonna be no smiles in those photos. Yeah, they're gonna like, eat mm, kale. Mm, mm. Now, if they were growing like spinach, no, I'd no, be down. No, actually, you know what? No, she's right. Kale is great in space because you can't taste anything. Mm, put hot sauce on it. Sriracha and uh, kale. Uh, yeah. Okay. There we go. All right, now, man. All right. Genius. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh -huh. What else? 
So, <laughs> so this is really great because you know, we, we, if we want to send humans into space, we need to grow food up there. And <laughs> everyone always seems to be talking about, yeah, lettuce. We're growing all this lettuce, but we need to expand. Like, if I'm an astronaut, I just don't want to eat lettuce every single day. Like, give me some variety. So, so now you've gone from lettuce to kale. Exactly. Oh man. Again, well, you've you got your lettuce, your kale, it's totally and your fine. It doesn't matter. Lettuce, kale, and what? Bugs? Like we can have bugs? Oh yeah, dude. Oh, mealworms. Bugs are not bad. Good, man. Mealworms are good. Have we ever had bugs before? Yeah, we had some. There's some ice cream that we had recently. It was a matcha green tea matcha ice cream with coconut mealworms and chocolate covered crickets, and it was amazing. I know. They're so good. Yeah, really. And good. they're like, un there's an unbelievable amount of protein packed in the bugs too. I don't think we've so. actually started growing uh, insects um, as a food source in the International Space. Station, but should. things like spiders have gone up to space. Um, <laughs> I wonder if maybe don't eat those spiders. But I we're think supposed <laughs> to be inspiring the planet to go to space, and if we're like, hey, you can have kale oh my and, and spiders, I, I don't feel like that's quite the the image people want of them in space. I want okay. like right, a right. spider. Don't all the ways that space can kill you like we covered in the last episode. Last this is true, we're still working on that, by <laughs> the way. We're just building our there variety, okay, guys? a community guys? post there. Yeah, all right, cool, um, what else is there? That's not the only thing they worked on this week. Um, so they started a new mission of the Sally Ride Earth Cam. Um, this is the 26th time that this uh, Earth camera has been um, used for educational purposes. So is it 8K? I don't think it's 8K. No, I don't like it. But it is oh, like wow. HD. So um, anyone uh, in any classroom around the world can sign up to Sally Ride Earth Cam. They get control over a web interface of the camera. They get to choose what the camera is going to point at. They get those images downloaded straight to their classroom. Um, and so far, this program has uh, had 37 countries involved and over 20,000 students nice. around the world. Awesome. Um, That's really cool. And they take awesome. pictures like this. This is of northern Australia. Um, really beautiful <laughs> picture. Can't that, imagine why you picked this one. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Where's your house? Yeah, it's weird. Where's oh, your house? A bit south from here. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, just give me your crap. Go on. So yeah, if if you're in a classroom, if you have kids interested in space, check out Sally Ride Earth Cam, and they get to actually control uh, and and also learn about what it takes to take a picture from space, right? Because you're yeah. moving at oh, yeah. you're moving at like twenty eight thousand one hundred and sixty three kilometers per hour. So there's a lot of uh, you know stuff See that goes you into then. that. You yeah. want it to go blurry, right? What's that in miles per hour, Jared? Seventeen thousand uh, five hundred. <laughs> wow. Hold on, let me get Google real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's EarthCam with a K, E A R T H K A M dot org, um, if you're interested. I, just to like throw a little bit on that, uh, back when the Grail mission from JPL was orbiting around the moon, there were two uh, Sally Ride Moon Cam cameras on board of that, oh, and they cool. had the exact same program um, for students, but in orbit around the moon. That's so cool. So, yes. and there's some really cool uh, video that they took with those uh, from Grail, like skimming a couple kilometers off of the surface of the moon, and it is amazing. Cool. And it's like, uh, it's like a classroom ordered that, you right, know? It's yeah. just like, holy moly, mm -hmm. such a cool program that they're doing. So. I think we need to expand this. Wow. I think, like, you know, we need to have, like, Mars Cam, Venus Cam. I'd be right. so on board with that. You, tomorrow yeah. needs to create, like, little CubeSats that can be remote controlled okay, and send, it. like, imagers mm -hmm. on board that we can send to one to each planetary body and Pluto. Yep. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. I'm going to yeah, throw it in the chat room. Yeah, that's right. incredible. So that series. And so. series because dwarves are planets too. And, and yeah, Vesta, exactly. Vesta. Yeah, it'd be cool. And like, just start sending them out, and then give classrooms control of them. That's that's going to be the uh, the tomorrow cube set. I've always wanted like a project for tomorrow that we could physically build something. Do you know but Cam? I, yeah. That's funny. Um, but that's not all they did this week. Um, they also looked at the biomolecule extraction and sequencing technology, or best experiment. Oh, <laughs> that is a backronym. Yeah, of course such it a, is. Such a good yep. experiment. Um, this is like. Looking at bacteria on the space station, right? So you have like things growing all around you on station. They disinfect and, and whatnot. But this experiment is looking at can you actually identify in real time which bacteria are up there? So you can kind of um, what's that growing on the panel? Exactly. You can <laughs> find out what it is. Um, so you you know whether like this is actually dangerous. We need to like preemptively take <laughs> antibiotics so that we don't get sick. Um, because get the Lysol kind of thing, right? You at the moment what they have to do is take the samples. Um, they ha they can. They can extract the DNA from the samples, um, and the quickest way usually is to send it back to Earth, and then you know you got to wait for it to go back down, figure out what what it is and whether it's dangerous. But this experiment is doing it on stations, so you know less chance of astronauts getting sick if you find something 
that is pretty bad for them. Um, but they're also looking at whether these bacteria actually mutate on the station being exposed to all the radiation around there because, you know, let, let's say that you have something growing on a panel and, you know, some solar radi radiation comes in or, um, you know, cosmic rays, that bacteria mutates while you're there and now you're like, you've got this stuff growing all over the wall and your antibiotics aren't working. Like this is... Is that how we get super villains? Probably. Did they make a movie about it called Life? I think that was the name of the movie on the ISS. That was a super bug. Anyway, <laughs> um, so they're doing that. And then they also looked at proteins growing in space as well. So uh, proteins form better crystals in space. And if you can turn the protein into a crystal, um, the bigger the crystal is, the better quality it is. And you can take, take snapshots of the crystal and figure out the shape of the protein. If you know the shape of the protein, you can directly design better drugs to like attach to that protein, and so you can have better treatments for sicknesses that we have. So they're hmm. looking at proteins in space as well, um, and hopefully designing better drugs that not only can help astronauts in space, but they're doing it to get the data to make the drugs better on Earth for people on Earth that have diseases. So cool. I feel like they've been doing protein crystals at the space station, though, like for the past 18 years. Like, I remember hearing about protein crystals when I was a kid. Yep, yep, they have. This is actually the fourth um, uh, iteration of this experiment, the LMM Biophysics 4 experiment. So, um, is this for a specific pharmaceutical or is this just for in, in general for, for a different type of study? Um, they're actually testing two different microscopes um, in this particular version of the experiment. So um, usually they just uh, are looking at uh, specific proteins, but in this one they wanted to figure out if there was a better microscope they could use. So in this one they're looking at uh, what's called a bright field microscope, which is just a regular microscope with a light on it, um, but they're also testing a confocal microscope, which is where you grow the protein crystals, but you um, actually tack on, uh, kind of like the fish of tomorrow, you tack on a glowing fluorescent protein um, as like a tag, a, a chemical tag onto this protein. Um, and so it will glow when you expose it to the right color of light. Like my fish at tomorrow, they have protein, um, uh, pink and blue proteins within yeah. their bodies <laughs> that if you put a, a UV light, a black light on the fish tank, they will glow. Uh, same kind of thing, oh, wow. except you're making the yeah. protein crystals glow in space with a microscope on it that's shining not just like a regular light, but the exact color of light you need um, that you tagged the chemical uh, tag onto your proteins with. Um, so they're using that that's to look, cool. at the, look at the protein in space and see if they can get better resolution to help them figure out the shape to make better drugs. Are they also like the Fish of Tomorrow, where if you have the UV light on too long, they just burn? I mean, probably. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> just double checking. I don't have a UV light on my fish. Just saying. That's just an sunburned. example. We, we discussed that earlier. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Still uh, checking. Uh, <laughs> I'm fish. in the Hyperloops, uh, hopefully in a pod or where the Hyperloop's not depressurized. It uh, <laughs> says, great ISS science update. And actually, that was kind of fun. I like yeah. uh, um, taking some of the science that's being done up there and, and bringing it back home so that we understand, like, why we have this $100 billion structure, yeah. kind of important, because we keep talking about, oh, we're doing science on Space Station, but we never really talk about, like, why why it matters, or who cares, or what, you know, what the big deal is, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, mm -hmm. bringing some of this stuff home, I think, is a, is a pretty big deal. There's a little bit less than usual at the moment um, of science going on because of all the problems we've Because there's a hole with the, with the, the hole, <laughs> with the crew rotations, um, so, you know, science time has kind of uh, settled down a little bit, also because, you know, this crew was supposed to have left by now, right. so, you know, they all always get training on all the different experiments up there, but... If you're not expecting to be running this particular experiment, like you don't get as much training on it. Whereas yeah. the guys that were supposed to already be up there by now have more in-depth training on the specific experiments that are scheduled in the timeline for now. Right, so. right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm getting a low battery alert on our hologram. Uh, it's saying that we're having a problem with him. So we're going to oh, have to okay. uh, go yeah. through the next story a little bit quickly. Yeah. Which uh, I can do. So. Uh, so we'll do that, and then uh, we're going to go to break after that, and then we're probably going to lose our hologram because I think we're going to lose the battery, and then we're going to... Yeah. We, due to orbit orbital mechanics, we won't be able to get a signal from him at that point. That's how that works. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jared... He's starting to... 10%, I think. <laughs> yeah. so it's at 9% now. <laughs> you going fast. Go. All right, let's go to the Southern Hemisphere. Ready? Oh, yay! Because we're going to go to upside, the, the upside down. I mean, yes. I am later um, today, but. Uh, sure. a, a little bit upside down. We're going to go to the European Southern Observatory's aptly named Very Large Telescope, which is a collection of four 8.2 meter telescopes. No clue what that is in feet. Um, and uh, these are some of the largest telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and they are used by a multitude of scientists. And there is a very cool instrument there called gravity, which has this uh, sort of excellent looking uh, vessel 
hole with a whole bunch of stuff going into it, and that is essentially piping the light from those four 8.2 meter telescopes in to generate what's called an interferometer. That's basically combine all the light, and it makes it like one very big telescope. So it makes it the equivalent of a 200 meter telescope. Oh. So a big old honking thing, uh, gravity. Large. Gravity, not an acronym, not a backronym. They just call it gravity. Um, so, it's just gravity is a good name. Yeah, it's cause it just it sounds cool. Um, <laughs> so they aimed it at the center of the Milky Way to look at a object that we know is there called Sagittarius A star. Now, this object is thought to have been a supermassive black hole that has about four million uh, times the mass of our sun, so about four million solar masses. Uh, this is a little clip here that is observations of a star called S2, which is that star that's moving very, very quickly in the center of the screen there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the closest orbiting star to Sagittarius A star. Uh, it comes within 17 light hours of what would be the event horizon of Sagittarius A star, and that orbital period is 16 years. So in this image, actually seeing 20 years worth of data and this is so cool oh, because you can yeah. see the point when adaptive optics becomes a thing because the fuzz becomes very sharp mm -hmm. uh, so see uh, you know it's just it's just so cool to see that here we are and then adaptive optics so <laughs> it's just so, so cool so this to is see a collection that. of data not just from the very large telescope but from from telescopes that we've been observing this for decades yeah so this would be uh, even from uh, the wow. Keck telescope back in the 90s when they were working with that so uh, yeah with the team wow. from I think it was the Nuker team from UCLA which was basically like <laughs> which basically looked at the entire astronomical world and said screw you guys we're gonna go find some black holes and they did so, <laughs> and they basically wow. proved that they do actually exist. Um, but you used gravity in order to actually look at really small, minute areas. Um, and they were able to find this material that was dropping into uh, very close to the event horizon, not quite crossing it, but close enough that it would speed up to about 30% of the speed of light. It would get so hot that it would flare in the infrared wavelengths and they were able to take a look at it. And basically what this does is this provides direct evidence evidence that, yep, there is a supermassive black hole there. Not that we had a lot of doubt about that because you don't get a star like S2 moving at hypervelocity speeds like it is around a dark source um, without it being a black hole. But this was just basically like, yep, proving once and for all indisputable evidence, bam, there is your black hole right there. So. Really cool stuff, seeing this super zoom into the center of our galaxy. And Zooming then, and enhanced. And then taking a look at that incredible oh, wow. data again. Um, even even sharper kind of showing it there with the difference between um, the original data without adaptive optics and then getting the adaptive optics data. Um, and kind of watching it slow there and then coming in Zoom even in closer. Enhance. Zoom, enhance. And now we're actually looking at the orbit of S2 as it comes in extremely close to where Sagittarius A star, that supermassive black hole, would be at and tracking it and then Zoom sort of a simulated view of what the infrared flare would look like uh, as it approaches the event horizon there and then kind of works its way around. I don't want to so, be there. No, no, I don't <laughs> think a lot of people terrible. would want to be there, honestly. Um, maybe hey, some folks sunscreen. I know at UCLA would, but uh, not any of us here probably on the set. But there you go, black hole confirmed. So, yeah. very cool. Chris yes. more, says, more evidence. Chris Radcliffe so. says, this is why we want 8K. Yep, that's right. Exactly. Hook up a red helium and <laughs> chuck it Fine. towards... I mean, that's not going to be too difficult to get it to the center of the galaxy, right? <laughs> nah, it'll be fine. Piece of cake. Just throw it. All right, uh, the hologram's battery is on critical, so before we go into break, I did want to th say thank you to all the citizens of, t of tomorrow who helped to make this segment happen. These are people who contributed $10 or more to the uh, episode. And again, uh, your contributions to the show help make us do this week after week. We want to do things like we want to do more episodes. We want to be able to do more science. Uh, we want to bring, uh, we actually want to bring on Lisa full time if we can. We want to do a lot of really great things with the show. Um, and in order to do that, we need cash, cash, money, yo. And <laughs> uh, fair enough. Anything you can do to help uh, is uh, greatly appreciated because uh, you know it all goes 100. 
100% of that, actually more than 100% of it, goes back into the show to make it bigger, badder, and more awesome. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows so tomorrow, head over to patreon.com slash tmro. And of course, you know, not everyone can contribute financially. That's totally, like, I understand that. Uh, if you want to contribute with time, or even if you don't want to do that, if you want to just contribute simply by clicking a couple buttons, subscribe, hit the bell on YouTube, tell your friends. Right, that helps. And like, share this video. Yeah, sh and share, share right? Video. Yeah, get, get other people excited about the show. Mm -hmm. Th that goes a long way towards the show, getting other people excited. Uh, and then, again, if you've got talents, uh, they were mocking me for saying cooking, but I'm sure we can find a way. It's like, people have... Craft services would be sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yeah. I gotta say. Oh yeah, like, absolutely. I'd love to have food. I'm just saying I'm hungry. Here. Yeah, so me too. <laughs> uh, but you know, your pat everyone watching the show is passionate about space and something. Whatever that and something is, whatever you're just really good at, let us know. Let's do something cool, all right? All right. On that note, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to have comments from our on-demand community. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> welcome. So AOS. There you go. Oh. No, so what no you acronyms. Care? No acronyms. Exactly. exactly. Acqu acquisition of signal. All Fine. right. Uh, yeah, I'm allowed to say that. Bermuda what, online. What, what you don't realize <laughs> and what I had forgotten is that this show has automation built into it. Yes. And so our director, Dutta, was out here because. Uh, yeah, you, you know, were freaking out. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I was giving him time cues. And uh, like, you know, blah, 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 this is ending. He doesn't need them. He doesn't need them because the system automatically came back to us and unmuted our microphones yep. when the clip was done. So he's out here nonchalantly readjusting the cameras and I'm like, <laughs> you have three seconds to get back to the engineer. Like, you're not gonna make it. And I hear the mics kick in and then I see the thing come back. I'm like, I need to be back on air now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wasn't worried. <laughs> he wasn't worried at all, and I'm over here freaking out. All right, uh, Capcom. Do you even do the show? <laughs> Apparently not. No. Apparently not. Apparently. No. Uh, so, <laughs> last week was 11.42. <laughs> hashtag Space Brains. Space uh, Brains. Can't see you do it. Space <laughs> Brains. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I did that wrong hashtag anyway. It doesn't really matter. You, you like this one, right? I, yeah, I prefer she, she this does, one. You, you do this one, she does this one. Yeah, this one. One hand. Yeah, one hand. More efficient. It's great. There you go. Yeah, but this is like. What, I what mean is this. this? What is happening? What is going on? <laughs> You're the worst millennial. Some Harry ever. Potter stuff. Man, oh, man. Oh, I hurt my shoulder for. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, oh. it's after dark. Wow. It's not after dark, but that's okay. So, um, the first comic comes off of YouTube. <laughs> From the moon is square. She really is broken. Uh, <laughs> says, how does the moon ever prepare for EDL onto Mars? How does going back to the toxic, abrasive moon dust prove that Mars dust does to humans in spacesuits? Why? So why do anything on the moon instead of Mars? 
Yeah, this is a debate that Jared and I have a little bit. Because um, mm -hmm. I'm all about going to the moon because we can test stuff on the moon kind yes. of in our backyard. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So you're not wrong in that the e entry, descent, landing, EDL, will be different on the moon. That's the only, I would say that's the only point that we actually disagree on. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Everything think, else, we're like in total agreement. But, but EDL but my, is a century, uh, entry, entry, descent, and landing. Sorry, I just read it verbatim as opposed to explaining things. I apologize. Go yeah. on. Right. Yeah, so so um, my thing with EDL is we can already do entry, descent, and landing um, on Earth. We already know what that's like, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're doing that with rockets. Mm -hmm. By doing it on the moon, we're going to be able to see it in a near zero, like the atmosphere on the moon is like, what, this far it's off? It's so the, tenuous it's, that... It doesn't matter. It's it, irrelevant. It is irrelevant. It, it's a rounding error, right? So yeah. now we're going to be able to see what we can do with no atmosphere. And now when we've got something like Mars that has enough atmosphere to be a problem, but not enough to actually help slow you down, you got everything, you've got the scale built now at this point. Uh, so we can we can help to use some of that like it's not no data It's data that we can use to help with that entry descent and landing on Mars. I'm not saying it will be the same Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you know, there's lots of lots of <laughs> lessons that you can learn um, From EDL or entry descent and landing on the moon. We're just gonna say EDL like we okay. we can we can explain the acronym Yeah, yeah, you know, we've also done EDL on Mars But we haven't done EDL to the point of the weight that you're going to need for a crewed mission to Mars Absolutely right I think we now, on that too, like we have no idea what a Mars EDL looks like for like a BFR. Like, no, I mean, having a clue. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure SpaceX knows, but like, no one's done that before. There's animations, but <laughs> There's like, animations, yeah. No one's ever dropped, uh, what is it, like a hundred tons at once on the <laughs> surface of Mars. Hasn't somebody <laughs> done so, that in curl yet? I mean, yet? I don't understand. We, I don't think we've even <laughs> dropped a hundred tons of material total um, on the surface of the moon. Right. So, huh. I, I mean, in the history of humanity chucking things at the moon. But this is where I, I, landing, the, having EDL on the moon will help us with a EDL bit. on the Mars. It'll help with, gui I, I imagine, like, guidance development and things like that. Oh, that's it. We'll he definitely... did say the Mars, by the way. Did I say the oh, Mars? I didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even catch myself doing that. The Mars. Yeah. So, well, the Mars. Nice. Sorry. Nice. I realized that there were a lot of comments last week about how we were derailed each other quite a bit and we do but you know we are a bunch of friends and we do like talking yeah. about this is kind of what we do uh at lunch the anyway Mars, yeah. but you said the mars <laughs> and that needed to be pointed out it's pretty good i apologize as Go opposed on. to the other mars yes. the, this mars specific mars, and the mars. mars. <laughs> or not mars california there you go. Actually, so. I think fundamentally we actually do agree. I, yeah. I think yes. we stick on a few uh, like minor points on m maybe some semantics. Yeah. But I think the I think the problem that maybe isn't being uh, uh, understood is that uh, with with EDL on Mars, especially if you're doing a crewed mission and you've already sent supplies before it, you have to do an extremely precise EDL on that, and mm -hmm. it's very difficult to do that when you don't know what the atmosphere is going to be like between hitting the top of it and landing where you need to. You basically, EDL right now, you have to do a very best guess of what the atmosphere is going to be like. Usually a couple days beforehand, you look at the data as to what it is from your orbital assets there, um, as best as they can give you with the atmosphere, and then you'll upload what you think is the best into the vehicle, and you just kind of hope that it's going to end up doing that correctly. That's why there's those massive landing ellipses for right. for uh, our robotic probes right now. It's not so much that we just want them to have a very large, wide area for them to land. It's just that there's really that many unknowns when it hits the top of the atmosphere that we actually don't know where it's going to land. Okay, but, so. but if we're doing propulsive landing, Landing all the way down, mm -hmm. and we've got humans on board. Mm -hmm. Can't they just Neil Armstrong that thing? Oh, uh, you you could. I imagine you could. Right. So, so the boom. But there that's you go. Ra it, you but for those for those who don't understand the reference, Neil Armstrong on Apollo 11, he looked at the landing zone and noped out of that, and yep. was like, and "Boulder, going and to manual. Yep, yeah, going to manual. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could. Um, ran the fuel tank down to empty. Like the <laughs> little meters going down. You know how, like in your car, you get the little low fuel light. He was like, "Eh, yeah." He wasn't looking at the light. He was letting Buzz take care of that. So, um, but um, you know, it's still it's still tough. It's still going to be a lot tougher than the moon is because the moon is just straight propulsive. So, CFIT asks: So, Mars atmosphere is lumpy? Uh, yeah, actually, Earth's atmosphere is lumpy. Mm. It's not consistent all over the place. 
It's uh, if you go to the if you go to the polls, it's it's uh, it's not as uh, I guess the I would describe the depth at the poles of the Earth with its atmosphere is not as thick as it would be at the equator of the atmosphere. Uh, and that's, there's obviously a lot of factors going into play with that. Um, but that would be even more in play at Mars because the atmosphere is a lot thinner, the gravity is a lot right? less. If there happens to be a dust storm, it's going to be way thicker than Yep, usual. if you have a dust storm on your, that was actually a major concern for InSight um, coming up on the landing but in there, there a couple weeks. But involved there. Well, you got to remember how high is the dust in the atmosphere and how, how deep are we going to be, how thin is the atmosphere, so how, what altitude are we going to be hitting dust at because if we're hitting dust at a very high altitude when we're moving at a very high velocity that scratch everything uh, yeah that could actually end up damage the paint job it could a little bit more than the paint job <laughs> um, with that there um how big is the dust is that going to shred the parachute when mm. it opens up oh, yeah. so yeah so these are things that you really have to worry about that you don't have to worry about on the so moon. lead but, parachute so. got it lead <laughs> par <laughs> right but we can still learn things so back to the original comment we can still learn things on the moon right? yes we can oh, absolutely, absolutely. Learn yes. some certain EDL techniques, especially with an all propulsive system that's yes. not using parachute because parachute landing on the moon, mm -hmm. not a thing. Yeah, yeah. no, not I at mean, all. I mean, you could maybe, dump maybe, one out for yeah. fun <laughs> yeah. if you want to. <laughs> Look at that. You know, um, but okay, that's going to be the tomorrow experiment. It's going to be cubes out with just, a parachute. Just a parachute just going <laughs> thunk into Mars. Uh, <laughs> or not, Mar the moon, whatever. The Mars. The, the Mars, whatever. I can see uh, how you get those cookies. And then uh, lunar regolith. That, that was the second point that was brought up. Uh, lunar regolith is oh, sharp and nasty gracious. stuff that wants to just like rip your spacesuit apart and get in all Ugh. the, yeah, it's terrible stuff. But you know what? Ugh. Mars regolith, while better, not that much better. No, chemistry wise. Good lord, yeah, so, that's not stuff you want to breathe in. Yeah, so. so learning how to deal with that on the moon will translate to how we deal with it on Mars as yes. well. So there are absolutely yeah. lessons that we can learn on yes. the moon. I think my personal opinion in, in the big thing with the moon o over Mars and why we should go there first is that uh, you know, we don't have our deep space legs anymore. Yeah. We haven't been to the moon in a long time. Mm -hmm. We haven't been past the moon since Apollo. And there are lessons that we're going to unfortunately need to relearn. And yes. I, I'm of the opinion those lessons should be relearned close to home mm -hmm. but before you embark on the, you know, year-ish journey to Mars. I think that that right. just makes a yeah. ton more sense. A 72-hour so. abort capability is a lot better than, well, you fired the engines. Uh, Peace out. See you in a bit. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, and I'm with you on that, too. So yeah. that's why it's, that's why I'm firmly moon first. So, yeah. All right. All right. Beautiful. Um, there you go. Next comment also comes off of YouTube from one Barry Hayworth. With the launches by Country Table, I vote to restore Rocket Lab's launches to a separate New Zealand category rather than lumping in, in with the United States. Okay, I get that they are owned by a U.S. parent company, but the founder and CEO is a New Zealander, and the part and the part of the company doing the launches is located in New Zealand. Um, this is such a debate, and it's it's so interesting. We've and been all like in our post shows. Oh, it's oh man, it's just I yeah. mean, because then I mean, you could you could then categorize the SpaceX launches, you know, as partially being part of like South, South African Africa. launches. Like that's just not going to be a thing. Like that that part of it doesn't make any sense. Um, I think really it boils down to the the uh, what would we say the governing body. Like they have to get licensing from the FCC. No. F the FAA, F -A -A. the other well, probably the FCC and the FCC too. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Mm -hmm. and, and so Noah, you're correct. All of the things. And Noah. <laughs> oh, Noah. But but that's true though. And so and those are all entities. Those are government agencies that are in the United States, and that's why it ends up getting categorized as the United States. And again, their name is Rocket Lab USA. Chris but, Radcliffe brings up a good point. Yes. Which is, it feels like Rocket Rocket Lab's heart is in New Zealand. Fantastic. So, yeah, so anyone who has company. a heart transplant doesn't make them a new person. <laughs> no offense, okay? <laughs> like, That's yes, taking I see. the literal though. I no, mean I see, it, it I feels see like their saying. soul, like they like their their <laughs> Their being is in New Zealand, although they are a U.S. company. And L.A. is the new Silicon Valley, but the, that still makes it L.A. And Silicon Valley is still Silicon Valley. Like those are two separate things, though. And they're going to launch from the U.S. In the, Stormer mentions they're going to launch in the U.S. in the future. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a yeah. Threat. I don't know. I be because they're a U.S. company. 
controlled by the U.S., and I think it was the governing body, like, if the rocket lab launch fails and it hits someone's house, mm -hmm. what country is responsible for that? Right. And I believe the answer to that is the United States. Well, so, I mean, you go back, uh, this is, it's kind of too bad, we don't have space, Mike, for this one, uh, but talking about, uh, like, ESA launches and stuff like that, there are some of those <laughs> launches that are, like, not from... Right, that are not from European Union ground, but they are controlled by European mm -hmm. Union. It's like a European Union rocket, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. like those sorts of things. So, like, that that's I mean, you have to draw the line somewhere at some point. And the more the longer <laughs> rocket, particularly Rocket Lab, continues to go on, they become more and more American. Uh, I'm just gonna have to go with that. Like, I apologize. Look and again, if you disagree, here's the camera I'm on. If you disagree, hit Wikipedia and change it there. But like, somebody <laughs> at some point has got to like, you have to draw the line somewhere. So we're doing the Wikipedia standard. I mean, uh, for this. we are at the moment. It just it's <laughs> it's easy because they've had that debate. As well, yeah, right? I was gonna say that like last week, didn't we have like a thirty-minute-long debate about this? Oh, this exact topic. Yes, yeah, which, yeah. I mean, it was so. just exactly why it came back, and I guess mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to. Uh, well, I think yeah. we did it off camera. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Loopy Dragon says they're a New Zealand company incorporated in the U.S. You actually got that 180 degrees backwards. They're a United States company, which I believe is then has a wholly owned subsidiary in New Zealand. Yeah, but it is in fact Rocket Lab USA. That is the parent company with mm -hmm. an uh, with yep. an arm that sits in New Zealand and that's why we opted to go with the this was seriously seriously this we were sitting here debating this oh, round and round and round we went and like we we would all be convinced one way and then we'd all be convinced another way and then we all, and then finally we ended on well Wikipedia says they're in the US now so that's well, what no, we're doing. but again I mean like, like I said the F, probably again the FCC or FAA all of the F's apparently and Noah uh, and Noah uh, you know, when you have to go through that sort of governing body, that those governing agents, uh, I, I, that's just U.S. Then, if they didn't have to pay any attention to those, then cool, they can do whatever they want. Anyway, <laughs> so <sighs> Chris, Chris Radcliffe Clemson's Saturn V was, was a German, German launch. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, technically, if we want to get historically oh, accurate, man. it wasn't Germany that did it. But we're not going to talk about who did it. So that's that's yeah, well, yeah. There's so. that man. <laughs> okay, really, I'm, 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 <clears throat> whew, all all right. Right. <clears throat> Moving on, so Lisa can join the conversation. Next. Again. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, she's sitting there uncomfortably. I didn't like, read the I comments before the show. And what's the Rule, Lisa. I know, and then I scrolled down, and I was like, "Ha ha, ha ha ha." Anyway, Dang it. <laughs> sometimes it's just fun <laughs> to do that. Next comment comes off of Reddit. Hey, Jared, how you oh feeling? My God, I hope you read the comments. <laughs> no, wicked. all right. <laughs> I did read the comments. Uh, <laughs> wow. Oh <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> to it. Oh my God. Hang on, hang on one second. Oh. Can I say that on air? No, no well, I would not. I would not. <laughs> don't, don't say um, that on air. Holy this is why you watch live, moly. and this is why you hang out with us in the oh, chat room. Oh goodness. Let's just say that. That oh. is, uh, mm -hmm, uh, uh, yeah, we're, no. Right, oh. so, next comment comes off of Reddit. Oh, from boy. one arrow spiked, assuming again that arrow spiked is still watching the show. Uh, maybe not, I mean, uh, maybe not. Arrow yeah, spiked is very possible. Uh, and I, I will uh, argue, rightfully so. And there's Jared dissing on Reddit again for the second time in After Dark. No wonder this place is so popular. Popular. Talking about Reddit and how we have like no one on Reddit. Mm. Actually, this is actually not Jared's fault. This is my fault. Um, I started the trend and I was wrong. And so I know number whatever the rule is, Ben is always wrong. Ha 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 ha. But no, really, in this case. So w what happened was, um, you know, I work for Company X and I actually use slash R slash SpaceX as a very valuable resource when uh, Company X is in the middle of webcast to understand are things working, are people enjoying this, like uh, what can we do better, what can we do different. Um, I, th I thought it important to kind of listen to the community of, of people who are excited about this stuff and, and get their feedback. And then they, they realized very quickly that I worked at Company X. I didn't really hide it, I, you, you, you can't. Um, yeah. I still don't, right? I mean, I mean, I'll say Company X, but you all know who it is. Um, and uh, and the reason we say Company X is because I don't, um, to be clear, I don't represent them on this show. Yeah. They are no part of this show. My views and my opinions are my own. We try to make a very, very, very distinct line between that, right? I like Company X has nothing to do with this. That's why I don't talk about them. Uh, so, um, uh, needless to say, X Core. 
Uh, right, exactly. There are a lot of X's in aerospace. Obviously. So, yeah, exactly. So needless to say, um, started landing boosters. We have blackout zones uh, or you know periods where uh, this radio signal won't make it down. We can't penetrate. And so you like the thing you want to see, you don't get to see. Yeah, plasma. No one. Pl physics says no. F physics says no. And and um, uh, I started getting some. And, and I'll be blunt. B very bad engineering suggestions on Reddit, over and over and mm -hmm. over again. But just like on this show, I can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Right? I can't tell you what's going on. I can't tell you why it will or w won't work. I can't tell you anything. All I can say is, I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, no. And by like the thousandth, thousandth time that I had said I'm sorry, no, it, it, it started wearing on me. I, I, I didn't realize I, you worked for a creative software company. That's <laughs> really entertaining. I, I'm sad that I took it out on Reddit as a whole because ultimately what's happening here mm -hmm. is a good thing. This is, these are passionate individuals who are trying to help. They're not trying to be jerks about it. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a handful of them are, but that doesn't represent the community of a whole, as a whole. And so it just, it just got to be so much uh, that it, I, I started referencing it as uh, the Reddit armchair engineering community. Like it's really easy to armchair engineer this stuff. Uh, and then it just kind of began to become this joke about Reddit. And it was, A, it wasn't all of Reddit. B, it's not actually their fault. They don't have all the data. I mm -hmm. can't give it to them. Mm -hmm. So they can't make good decisions based on data they don't have. I get that, but I did have the data. So I knew that these, I'm like, no, 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 no. Tried it, no, 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 no. So uh, that's where that started from. Uh, and then it became kind of a running joke on tomorrow. Uh, and it's not fair to Reddit because mm -hmm. I actually, I am a member of Reddit. Um, I do participate. I, I am no longer a member of slash r slash SpaceX, not because they're bad people, but because it's, it's I, I just, I can't, right? Just due to my role, I, I mm -hmm. just can't anymore, unfortunately, because there are people who don't understand and then they just, they try to take advantage and so I can't. Um, and, and it's not Reddit's fault. It's not, and it's not fair to them. So uh, I'm sorry. Uh, arrow spiked, uh, arrow, yeah, arrow spiked, you're not wrong. I started it and I'm here by stopping it as well. Mm -hmm. I will no longer make fun of Reddit. Uh, will you well, start posting to Reddit again? Will you start posting our show to Reddit again? To be fair, we've, I think. Like, I don't feel like that's actually appropriate for Reddit. So we've it, also moved to the community forums, right? Yeah, and, and, yeah. and both of those <laughs> things are kind of a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between the, plat the platform of Reddit in terms of like, you know, People just post stuff and people comment on it, and like the community forums is kind of similar, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and Space Vogel says, whatever, Ben, your action was perfectly valid. I feel like everyone understands what you're making fun of. Yeah, so, and, and I never really meant it, to be clear, I never meant it as um, I think these people are stupid or anything else like that. I always viewed them as excited without all of the information, right? Mm -hmm. and so, yeah. that was always my viewpoint. But it was like, just like we poke fun at each other on the show and we poke fun at other things during the show, that's, that's what I was doing. But then when you lose that reference point to what we're making fun of, now it just sounds like we're making fun of something. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, that's not fair. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I just don't think that's fair. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think that's actually fundamentally what happened there. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we just won't do that anymore. Uh, but no, I'm not going to post on the show because I think the community should post on the show. Reddit's a community forum. I, I think if you're excited about the episode, you should post it and add your own commentary to it. Mm -hmm. You should call it, call us out on stupid things we do. I do stupid stuff all the time. Like the Mars. Like the Mars. Yeah. I feel like this episode should be titled The Mars. Hashtag. Hashtag, Hashtag the, the Mars. Mars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do. Um, I I do also. Dang it! Now I gotta write that down. I do also want to say I did go back and I did rewatch the After Dark where I did make the two comments about Reddit, um, and they were very much punching down and not in line with with what I particularly want to put out as jokes. So I I do want to apologize for what I said about Reddit. Look, we screwed up. Yeah, we're I, sorry. I made a mistake. It was it was very uncool on my part to have punched down. The way I did, and you're absolutely correct in calling me out on that, and I do sincerely apologize for that. So, um, anyhow, Aeros Aerospike so. in the chat, by oh, the way. Hi, yeah. hi said, Aerospike. Thank you, thank you for I, I actually think bringing a, that up. Yeah, I think so. it's a valid comment. I think uh -huh. it makes sense. Uh, yeah. And, and I actually, I will. To your point, I'm not going to necessarily post more because I actually think the community should be posting there. I would. I won't be posting the shows. I, I think the community should do that with their own comments, but I will be posting there more. And I found it obviously by going there. Yeah. Right? I, so, yeah, understood. Uh, and I'm going to work on the, uh, sorry, uh, I'm going to work on the Patreon integration into Reddit. We're going we're gonna to do some stuff there, I think. 
Uh, but yeah, I, I do. I do spend more of my time on the community forums because I, I think for a show like us, that's a better format. Mm -hmm. Like that's a better. It works better for for something like what we're trying to do because you can search for. It's, it's just. I think it's better for us. Anyhow, there you go. Yeah, we spent too much time on that. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's all right. It. All right. Um, let's close out the show by thanking uh, all of the people who make it possible. These are people who contribute ten dollars or more. We've actually got all of the different uh, uh, values in here. We got ten dollars, five dollars, two fifty, uh, and a dollar uh, is is what you can contribute financially to the show if you want over at Patreon.com/tmro. And by contributing to the show, we're going to give stuff back to you. Uh, and actually, we're kind of in a moment of review of like, hey, what things make sense. So I'm looking at After Dark, going, you know, maybe. We don't do After Dark, like maybe we'd still do After Dark, but we just give it to everyone. Maybe, I think we need to re-look at our reward tiers and give our patrons some better rewards, some things that you, you really enjoy more. And I love your feedback on what you would like to see for the show. And I realize most people are contributing because they want to support the show, not because we give you something back, but it's important to me that we give something back to you uh, because it's our way of saying thank you. We realize that you, you this is your hard-earned money. We need to do good things with it. And I, I think one of the other things I'd like to do is start Start posting like what we do with it. Like you see, we have new chairs on the set. We have mm -hmm. a few new tables. We're trying to make stuff look nice. I'm looking at getting new lights over here. Looking at adding more cameras. We're looking at um, Dada doesn't well. Dada half knows this, but I'm looking at adding more to the set. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we actually want to do to enhance um, and and you know grow the show, and that all takes money. So um, it, your contributions help us a great deal. Uh, and, and I want to thank every single person on all of those lists for making that happen. To find out how you can contribute, patreon.com slash tmro. And as we keep saying, like and subscribe. Like us on Facebook. We're actually trying to post the final shows on Facebook. So go to our Facebook page. You know, you can consume the show there. Uh, you can also watch it. I think you can still watch it on Twitter through Periscope. Um, but then also subscribe to all of these different things. Those, those counts, those subscriber counts go a long way towards mm -hmm. us being able to do things. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're over 25 subscribers, 25, 25,000 25, oh, yeah. yeah, subscribers now has opened up some doors with YouTube that will help us to do some cool things. Uh, so once we hit 100,000, more doors open. Did you want to say something? No, I'm just really excited that we now have this opportunity to, to go through this YouTube program and you know, potentially make the show better because we have enough subscribers to make ourselves like, look legit in the eyes of other you know, companies. We don't really care how many subscribers we have. We kind of do, but that's not the most important it's thing It's a good us. ego number, but as I always say, I prefer to have quality people over quantity of people. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure the community is mm -hmm. awesome as opposed to having just a large community of awful. If that makes yeah. sense, yeah. and it's yeah. been amazing that that is what we have. We have oh, a, yeah. a a a quality community. Oh yeah, amongst tomorrow, and that's yeah. just like holy moly, like shining beacon. That on is unheard of on the internet. Yep, yep. So and I want to make sure we maintain that with good growth. Yes, mm -hmm. right. So uh, twenty five thousand to open up some doors for us. Hundred thousand is going to open up more doors, and a million. Once we hit a million, all doors are open at that point. And I do believe we can hit those numbers. And I believe we can hit those numbers and maintain a quality community. Mm -hmm. And we can do it with your help. Uh, so part of that is financial. So we're you know using that for uh, advertising the show. Part of that is time going out there, posting it on social media. Uh, and part of that is simply you subscribing to the show. All right, I've harped on that for long enough. Uh, uh, you know, I think next week is going to be another. We're, we're kind of changing out the format. We're trying it. We tweaked it a little bit this week. Let me know what you thought of the format tweak this week. Did you like it a little bit more? I kind of liked having the guest on last week. I don't know. I feel like we need to maybe have always a guest, someone in studio. Sure. They don't have to be big in the industry, but like someone new, a new face. Just to, yeah. Just I felt like that was kind of fun. Yeah. Not that yeah. I didn't like That's you cool. guys, but I just I don't know. So leave your comments. Uh, <laughs> on that note, uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna. Call a close to this. Uh, after Dark is up next, and today is a doubleheader, so science is after that. Thanks so much for watching. See y'all.